Danger is lurking off our coasts, and hardly anybody suspects anything. A rusting legacy of the past, ticking time bombs. This threat on the beds of the oceans is known to only a few experts worldwide. It's a race against time. But can we win the race? At the Baltic port of Gdynia in Poland, an expert team from the Marine Institute of Gdansk prepares to put to sea on the research ship Imor. On board are hydrographers, divers and biologists. They've been working together for years. Their destination lies in the Bay of Gdansk, just half an hour's sailing time from the port to a site where, in 1999, they made an alarming discovery. Head of the crew is Benedict Hack. A former commander in the Polish Navy, he's an uncomfortable warning voice in official ears. Obviously, not every official likes what we do, but it's not our job to please them or make things easy. It's more a type of mission. Stop the engines. We're over the spot. Benedict Hack has been sailing to these coordinates for years. The position lies just two kilometers off the Polish coast. The unspoilt beaches of the Bay of Gdansk are seen as the Polish Riviera. It's a mainstay of East European tourism. Over two million Europeans spend their summer holidays here every year. You can have a wonderful time in this area, of course. Holidays here are marvelous. Beautiful beaches, Nice people. Some think this will always be so, but sadly that's not the case. There's something here that only a few people know about, and unfortunately, it's very dangerous. The ship picks up speed to do a sonar scan of the seabed. Gradually, the sonar images reveal what it is that's threatening the nearby seaside idyll, a relic from the past. The wreck of the German hospital ship Stuttgart, nearly 170 meters long. In the autumn of 1943, the ship lay at anchor in Gdynia, which had been renamed Gortenhafen by the occupying Germans ready to take on wounded German soldiers from the Eastern Front. On the morning of the 9th of October, the crews of the American 8th Air Force in England were operational. 378 bombers took off from their bases. Their mission? to destroy the strategically vital ports and dockyards of the then Danzig and Gotenhafen. 
After a flight of over four hours, they reached their target area. The Stuttgart received a number of direct hits. Fire broke out on the hospital ship. The flames lit up the whole harbor. To prevent the mooring points from being blocked, the Stuttgart was towed out to sea and sunk in the bay. The event is just a side note in the history books. The wreck and its position fell into oblivion. Until 1999, Benedict Hack found the Stuttgart when he was mapping the seabed of the bay for the Gdansk Marine Institute. Since then, he has regularly returned to the position with his research ship. To monitor the condition of the 70-year-old wreck precisely, divers are braving the ice-cold waters of the Baltic. The Stuttgart lies a mere 20 meters down, overgrown with seaweed and shells. Not much is left of the former hospital ship. Just a few remains stick out of the seabed over a length of two football fields. In the 1950s, the wreck was partly blown up to salvage the steel for sale. At first glance, the wreck and its surroundings look harmless enough. As with every sortie to the Stuttgart, the researchers use a grab to take samples from the seabed. Even the first sample, as it's slowly brought up, reveals why Benedict Hack is so worried. Viscous drops of oil run out of the grab. The researchers call them the black tears of the sea. Over the years, they've collected over a thousand seabed samples from the Stuttgart. But what Benedict Hack and his team are bringing to the surface this time puts all previous samples in the shade. An evil smelling, sticky mass containing very little sand and all the more heavy oil. So much oil, what a filthy mess. Really unbelievable. I've honestly never seen anything like it here before. What a stink. The researchers will inspect the mud more closely in the laboratory. We're on the brink of an ecological catastrophe here. And it looks like there's nothing else we can do. What's happened here is the complete eradication of all forms of life. Benedict Hack intends to take another 200 seabed samples in order to be able to assess the extent of the pollution in the Bay of Gdansk. Is the Stuttgart just a tragic one-off case? What about all the other wrecks from the Second World War? Do they pose a threat to the environment? Less than 20 kilometers away from Benedict Hack and his research ship lies the Vesterplatte Peninsula. It was right here on the 1st of September 1939 that the Second World War broke out. At 
4.45 a.m., the German ship Schleswig-Holstein opened fire on Polish positions. It was also the prelude to a six-year naval war with huge losses. Gigantic fleets fought for supremacy at sea around the world. Merchant shipping was also very much in the firing line. Germany's naval and air forces tried to cut the supply lines of Allied troops. Dreaded above all were the German U-boats, the Grey Wolves. In June 1942, they sank an average of one ship every six hours. But how many ships altogether were sunk back then? And how many of them pose a threat today, like that of the Stuttgart? These questions take us to Tampa, on the Gulf of Mexico, in Florida. Every year, representatives of the US Coast Guard, scientists and salvage experts come together for the Clean Gulf Conference, a forum of the leading mines and companies involved in combating oil spills at sea. They include Dagmar Schmidt-Edkin, an American biologist in worldwide demand. Back in 2004, she was commissioned to find out how many dangerous wrecks lie in our oceans. I collected data on different wrecks in different places, including a number of German uh, databases, which I translated from German into English, and, and some of those were based on, you know, which U-boat had sunk which vessels. For two months, Dagmar Schmidt-Etkin meticulously searched through archives and gathered data worldwide. From all the shipwrecks she inspected, from sonar pictures like these, she included only those with combustion engines of over 400 gross registered tons and over 150 gross registered tons for tankers. So I found 8,500 and something wrecks uh, worldwide and about three quarters of those were World War II related. So it was a, was a surprise, you know? They're lying outside ports, at the sites of naval battles and along trade routes. The precise number of wrecks from the Second World War is 6,338. Whether Italian freighters in the Red Sea or Japanese battleships in the Pacific, Six years of war were responsible for the majority of all wrecks in the last hundred years of navigation. Sunk with the ships were tons of fuel and freight crude oil, stored in tanks in the ship's steel hulls. But no one knows exactly how much oil is involved, so Dagmar Schmidt-Etkin first produced an estimate for all large wrecks with combustion engines. If I had no information, I looked at the size of the vessel and, and uh, the type of vessel, uh, a tanker or a non-tank vessel, a, you know, like a bulk carrier or a victory ship or something like that. And I assumed, well, let's say at least 10% of the oil may still be on there, maybe 90%, maybe all, we don't know. So I have a range of, of values. So I estimated, using that methodology, estimated about 2.5 to 25 million tons of oil could potentially be on these wrecks. And that was something of concern because they could potentially leak out and cause the same kinds of damage as we see in other oil spills that, that occur now. One of the most serious catastrophes so far. The oil tanker Exxon Valdez ran aground off Alaska in 1989 and lost over 37,000 tons of crude oil. A mere fraction of the amount of oil lying dormant in the wrecks from the Second World War. According to Dagmar Schmidt-Etkin's study, these wrecks could still hold up to 15 million tons of oil, 400 times the amount the Exxon Valdez spilled into the sea. I presented my results on the numbers, and the reaction was, this is too big a problem and we can't deal with it. 
at least here in the United States, but also in other parts of the world. We're sort of buried. It's too complicated. We're not going to be able to deal with it. It's too expensive, and so we, there's nothing we can do. Dagmar schmidt Atkins' survey has been known for more than 12 years. For more than 12 years, experts have been discussing the problem at conferences. Virtually nothing has been done. This delay has fatal consequences. Some ships have already started to leak because no one has done anything about the toxic contents of the ships, and the tanks are now rusting through. A great many wrecks from the Second World War lie off the east coast of the United States. A research vessel puts to sea. It's from the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, known as NOAA. The researchers regularly look for lost ships from the Second World War, as here off North Carolina. Before Dagmar schmidt Etkin's study, it was mainly underwater archaeologists who were interested in wrecks. Increasingly, the researchers at NOAA are realizing they know far too little about the sunken ships of the Second World War. They therefore check the condition of every wreck they discover. How badly is the ship rusted? Is it losing oil? Finally, they measure the wreck with millimeter precision by laser. One of the principal goals of the administration is to protect the environment. At NOAA headquarters in Maryland, marine researcher Lisa Simons is responsible for monitoring wrecks in US waters. She was alarmed by Dagmar schmidt Etkin's study. She hadn't realized that there were so many wrecks containing millions of tons of fuel. Well, there was a lot of concern, and that was something that we were, um, we were very aware of because there's been a lot of allegations about the waters of the United States, the waters of, of Germany, Europe, um, Japan being full of ticking time bombs. With the 20, 000, uh, points on it, there are actually 30, 000, Lisa Simons wants to know exactly. Like in 2010, the U.S. Congress granted $1 million for NOAA to find out whether and what together. dangers are posed by the sunken vessels, ships in U.S. waters. It has taken a lot of very painstaking research effort with the archives, um, going back to the newspaper records. Sometimes you can find living crew members who remember um, being on a vessel or hearing about what happened to a vessel. What's the size of the ship? How much oil had it taken on board? What sort of fuel was it? Using 21 separate criteria, they're ranking the wrecks off the US coasts in terms of risk. Lisa Simons is currently gathering information on the freighter Coast Trader. In 1942, a Japanese submarine sank the ship off Seattle. According to the records they found, there could still be a thousand tons of fuel on board. And there's the edge of a hatch with the combing. Okay. Look at the decking there, you see how that's But failed. such information can be unreliable or simply wrong. Sometimes the researchers contest their assumptions with underwater robots. With the coast trader, they're particularly interested in the point where the torpedoes struck the ship. The damage is a lot worse than they assumed. The ship must have lost a substantial amount of oil as it sank. So this wreck now seems less of a danger than feared. Other ships, though, could just as well contain a lot more oil than calculated. The problem is they don't have the means to examine all the wrecks with underwater robots. Even with the coast trader, though, the potential danger is far from averted. The researchers suspect that its tanks might still hold 400 tons of oil. 
Specialists simulate on the computer what could happen if the toxic freight leaked. The first scenario, all 400 tons spill out. Great stretches of nature reserve on the Pacific coast will be contaminated. Altogether, they work through 200 simulations with varying wind directions and amounts of oil. In a bid to assess the threat and devise possible deployment plans for the worst case scenarios. Hey, Lisa, pull up the seat. I'll show you what we're working on. Okay, you've got the, the results are worrying. Yeah. They put the coast trader in a higher risk category because in most of the simulations, the oil slick reaches the coast. Lisa Simons knows what that means. When the freighter was sunk in 1942, the okay, beaches so the were covered in, in oil. We've got the Macaw Reservation. Um, during so World War II, the population was very used to having oil on the beaches, um, as well as having other detritus from war. And adults would go and check the beaches before they would allow kids down to the beaches. People kept cans of kerosene and baby oil outside their back doors to basically wipe off their feet if they had been walking along the surf. So I don't know that that's something that people are going to accept as a, um, as a way of life if that becomes an ongoing issue, whether it's here um, or, or any place else in the world. The researchers examined 573 major shipwrecks more closely. For 87 of them, they produced detailed reports. 36 would be a threat if all their oil leaked out and five wrecks from the Second World War are rated in the highest risk category, with catastrophic results should just one tank leak. The target audience, though, is the United States Coast Guard. These are the wrecks in your area of concern that we did an analysis of. This is what our findings are. These are the wrecks that we recommend that you put into active monitoring. And it's up to the US Coast Guard to determine whether or not they want to do an in-water assessment and then determine whether or not they want to remove the fuel. But the US Coast Guard has hardly reacted to the report from NOAA. They have so far not examined more closely a single one of the wrecks rated extremely dangerous, let alone pumped out the oil. Instead, the watchword is, wait and see. And not just in the USA. A perilous playing for time. But the marine researchers are not prepared to wait and see. NOAA operates its own satellite and information center. Here, analysts evaluate data in real time for the US Weather Service and work out long-term climate models. They also monitor the surface of the oceans around the clock, on the lookout for oil spills. The experts can recognize even the smallest irregularities from the radar images with the naked eye, like this ship on the high seas. Since NOAA's risk analysis, they pay special attention to the areas in which potentially dangerous wrecks are sighted. Above one Second World War wreck, which is not in the high-risk group, the analyst notices an unusual pattern, probably oil. He marks the dark patch in order to measure it. It's nine kilometers long and 150 meters wide, an area of about one and a half square kilometers. He immediately sends the finding to Lisa Simons. The wreck is no stranger to her. Oil slicks are regularly spotted over the Coimbra, a tanker that's broken up. Steve? We need to talk about Coimbra again. Despite this, the Coast Guard has so far no plans to pump the oil out of the wreck because it lies 50 kilometers off the coast. In the past, the oil slicks have dispersed in the sea, but with a bigger leak, the oil could reach the coast of New York, a risk that the authorities are prepared to accept. It is a question of money, but for some people, they're more concerned about trying to deal with their their issues now than a potential threat. Salvaging oil from sunken ships is possible, but expensive. 
That was seen in 2015, when the Russian trawler Oleg Nydenov caught fire and sank off the island of Gran Canaria. Salvage companies pumped out over a thousand tons of oil, which had gone down with the ship. A technically demanding undertaking, because the wreck lies at a depth of over 2,700 meters. The cost, 30 million euros. At this point, I believe we can take care of any wreck. We can operate in any operational environment and any ocean depth at this point. It's just a matter of uh, making the decision to go and look for the wreck and then to, uh, to solve the problem. That's all we need. Right. We only had a newspaper article. Jim Elliott is a former officer of the U.S. Coast Guard and vice president of the American Salvage Association, a recognized expert for difficult salvage operations around the world. The first thing to happen nowadays after a shipping accident, if the oil threatens the environment, it's pumped off. Otherwise, the owner of the ship is liable for environmental damage. In the case of the Oleg Nydenov, underwater robots cut open access holes to the fuel tanks. By remote control, funnel-shaped collecting vessels were then installed into which the viscous fuel oil could flow under supervision. But are the salvage operators also called out for wrecks from the Second World War, which had been rusting away for decades? To be honest with you, it's, uh, it's very rare that we, we do this. It's amazing that we're still talking about these wrecks and they haven't been, the, the issues haven't been solved. But there's an argument that if that oil releases, if you're in an environmentally sensitive area, it could be a lot more catastrophic and, and definitely a lot more expensive in the long run to do that. So for example, you're dealing with the pollution recovery costs and once oil's released from that wreck, you can only recover, say, 10 to 25% with current technology on the surface. So really, it's a losing game once, you've, once the oil is released. The Bay of Gdansk is one of the losers here. Oil already leaked out of the Stuttgart years ago. And Benedict Hack has himself experienced the wait and see attitude of the authorities. People are just closing their eyes because they simply don't know what to do. I shut and pass the problem on, in the hope that someone or other will deal with it sometime or other. Slowly, the government is starting to reconsider. But it has to be pushed to act, and that's what I do. It's a bit like David and Goliath, or Don Quixote. Yes, that's my job. Benedict Hack employs persistence and facts in a bid to get the Polish Environment Ministry to remove the environmental damage caused by the wreck of the Stuttgart. Chemists are to analyze the seabed samples he's collected from around the wreck. For two months, crates of new samples land in the Institute's laboratory every day. The chemical content of more than 200 plastic sacks of oil-contaminated sediment is being determined here. The findings are alarming. The pollution is much more serious than assumed. Some environment ministry thresholds for cancer-causing substances in the seabed are exceeded over a thousand-fold. That was a shock. No one expected that. So we took the results to other institutes, but all they said was, not possible. You're imagining it. Early morning, Benedict Hack wants to find out just what these values actually mean for the Bay of Gdansk. If there's an environmental impact, then one group in particular must be aware of it.
fishing in the Bay of Gdansk. For centuries, that's meant hard manual labor in small boats. Family businesses in which knowledge about the best fishing grounds is handed down from father to son. Wrecks are especially popular with fishermen. They're a sort of artificial reef and offer marine life protection against enemies. Benedict Hack is therefore sure that the fishermen are also casting their nets around the Stuttgart. And he's right. The fishermen confirm that just two days earlier, there was an intensive smell of oil at the site of the wreck. They've sometimes caught place in their nets there, they say, that have been sticky with oil or burnt by it. They don't land them, but throw them right back in the water. We're now joking at the Institute that you don't need oil to fry these tasty fish from the wreck because they bring their own. But it's black humor because the area is now contaminated and that is very, very dangerous. The fish ingest poison and ultimately we then eat it. I w końcowym efekcie to my chorujemy. Benedict Hack is working on his final report for the Polish Environment Ministry. With the data he's collected in the laboratory and from the fishermen, he hopes he'll finally be able to persuade the authorities to tackle the unsolved and hazardous problem of the contaminated seabed. I'm a thorn in their side. I tell them, there and there, it's contaminated. And they say, oh, it's nothing. Only you know about it. No one sees it. Let sleeping dogs lie. Are all countries reacting the same way to the slowly disintegrating wrecks? Don't look, wait and see. Because of its rugged fjord landscape, Norway has a coastline of over 20,000 kilometers. Oil escaping here would be an even greater catastrophe than elsewhere. That's why the Norwegian coastal authorities have adopted a different strategy. Hans-Peter Mortensholm is in charge of all wrecks off Norway. He's heading for the site where a German Second World War ship sank. What he finds shows clearly that waiting is not an option. Marine diesel is surfacing, drop by drop. People in Norway along the coastline, I think they are, they are used to seeing oil on the surface from the shipwrecks. Nazi warships discovered along the entire coastline started steaming up the Norwegian fjords. These are the long-term effects of one of the biggest military operations of the Second World War. The invasion of Norway by German forces in April 1940. A British counter-offensive led to fierce sea battles, especially for the port of Narvik. The Allied formation sank 10 German destroyers. Altogether, the German Navy lost a third of its total fleet in the battles around Norway. The traces of the fighting are still visible today. Some of the German wrecks lie directly on the coast, like the destroyer Georg Thiele. During the Second World War, some 900 ships were sunk in Norwegian waters. The Norwegian Coastal Authority has classed 29 of them as extremely dangerous because of the fuel on board. The wrecks are a magnet for divers, 
even though, or perhaps because, they're war graves. More than 4,000 sailors on both sides were killed in the sea battles. What very few of the divers realize is that the wrecks are an ecological time bomb, relentlessly ticking away. Again and again, oil leaks out of one or the other. Hans-Petter Mortensholm monitors all the wreck sites with high-definition cameras like the military use to spot the leaks in good time. At least once a week, Mortensholm and his team fly over all the wrecks classed as dangerous. Today's destination is the Oslo Fjord. A fifth of Norway's population lives close to this narrow estuary. An oil spill here would reach land in no time. The fjord flows past the coastal fortress of Oskarsborg, which played a key role during the war. In 1940, its guns sank the heavy cruiser Blücher. In the narrow fjord, the German ship was an easy target and sank with over 1,400 tons of fuel on board. The wreck of the Blücher now lies at a depth of 70 meters. What's not visible is that it now contains only a fraction of its original load of fuel. The Norwegian Coastal Authority had most of it pumped out in a controlled operation in 1994 to avert a catastrophe. There is still some left, uh, about 40 to 50 estimated uh, um, as cubics of diesel because they didn't empty the tanks uh, close to the uh, ammunition uh, storage rooms uh, due to the risk. And, uh, and in addition, uh, when you empty a wreck of uh, remaining oil, you will always have small pockets with diesel still in the wreck. From the air, Hans-Petter Mortensholm again and again spots some of the remaining oil leaking out of the Blücher. If it gets worse, he may have to conduct another pumping operation, despite the risk of an explosion. We also react because something is starting to leak more, but we have also emptied wrecks because of a risk they might pose in maybe 10 to 20 years. And the reason why we do uh, these kind of measures now is mainly due to the corrosion. In 10 to 20 years, it might be too late to do any physical operations on the wreck. Norway is the only country in the world which is already investing in safeguarding its coasts. While other countries, like the United States, prefer to wait and see rather than pumping, the wrecks continue rusting away. Depending on salt content, water depth or temperature, steel plate loses between 0.5 and 2 millimeters in thickness per decade. It doesn't sound much, but it adds up over time. In the Pacific, Australian researchers discovered that if steel plates lose between 3 and 10 millimeters of thickness, they become unstable and can break under even light pressure. Many wrecks from the Second World War are already entering this critical phase, or will do soon. The Norwegian government does not intend to wait until a catastrophe happens. It ordered seven more wrecks to be pumped out preemptively. The steel walls of the tanks are still stable enough to insert valves without breaking. The engineers also pumped out the German destroyer Erich Giese, but they discovered something unusual. Especially the German uh, Bankroyer has an extremely uh, strong uh, smell. So we were interested to see how, how toxic 
is the uh, oil, the bunker oil from the Second World War. Hans-Petter Mortensholm sent a sample for analysis to Trondheim, to one of the world's leading laboratories for analyzing marine oils. Oil slicks in Norway are so devastating because the oil is hard to deal with in the icy Arctic waters. The cold means it hardly disperses. The size of the droplets is also crucial in an oil spill. It determines how broad and thick an oil slick is, because one oil differs from another. The researchers here have already analyzed over 3,000 different types of oil. At first, analyzing the fuel pumped out of the German destroyer Erich Giese looked like a routine assignment. An early test simulated whether and how far the oil mixes with water in wave swells. The sample had to rotate in this device for 24 hours. Meanwhile, the scientists determined the precise chemical constituents of the Erich Giese oil. That brought a surprise. Some of the values were exceptionally high. We had never seen that before, so we thought first it was some kind of contamination in our laboratory. <coughs> but then we, uh, we did a new setup and it was the same. And we looked at the chemistry, we understood that this is a really strange oil. We have never seen anything as toxic as it before. Shortly afterwards came the next worrying find. Seawater and oil had resulted in a sludgy emulsion. In a leak, this mixture would be hard to pump away, while a comparison sample of British oil from the Second World War hardly mixed with the seawater at all. What no one knew so far, how would living organisms react to the strange oil? Tiny crustaceans form the basis of the food chain and are therefore the engine of the North Atlantic ecosystem. The researchers prepared a mixture of 40 parts seawater and one part of the unusually heavy oil. The copepods have to spend 96 hours in this liquid. After four days, the results were clear. All the crustaceans were either dead or virtually paralyzed. It was a mystery to the researchers why this oil was so exceptionally toxic. They looked for more information and stumbled across an American intelligence report from 1945. According to this, Germany had massive shortages of crude oil in the Second World War. As an alternative, oil was produced from coal, a process resulting in a much more dangerous fuel than conventionally refined oil. It has a high potential for actually causing adverse effects on the biota. So, there is something that should not be left around for waiting it for corrode into pieces and then start to do action about it, but it's something that should be preferably removed in a controlled manner. Benedict Hack has also heard of the findings in Trondheim and is worried. His chemical analysis of the Stuttgart oil is very similar. He knows that highly toxic oil is contaminating the seabed. What he doesn't know is how many tons of it have leaked into the Bay of Gdansk since the sinking of the Stuttgart. He looks for answers in the archives of the National Maritime Museum. The documentation reveals the first clues. Before it sank, the Stuttgart was ready to set out to sea so its tanks must have been full, 
full of highly dangerous synthetic fuel. This heavy oil simply spilled into the sea and sank immediately to the seabed. According to my research, it was between 850 and 1,000 tons. That's an awful lot. And this amount is spreading further and further, as the results of all his seabed samples show. When Benedict Hack found the wreck in 1999, 25,000 square meters of seabed were contaminated. Ten years later, it was already 32,000 square meters. And the rate of spreading is accelerating. The oil is flowing down an underwater slope. In the meantime, an area of over 50 football pitches is affected. Benedict Hack knows that a solution has to be found for 450,000 cubic meters of seabed. If we raise the remains of the wreck in the contaminated seabed and then remove it all, it will cost hundreds of millions of euros and we'll have the problem of where to put it. But if we seal the site with sand, cover it with a sort of sarcophagus, then we're talking of a sum of maybe 15 to 20 million euros. Benedict Hack believes it will be worth it, so the ecosystem of the Bay of Gdansk could recover. But with money, it's always the same. There's not enough of it. So the authorities take cover and push the problem away. They say, no, 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 no. Our coffers are empty and you want so much money. Sadly, that's how it is. But why should the Polish authorities pay the costs alone? Why doesn't Germany pay? The Stuttgart was a German ship after all. The question is, who is responsible for harm caused by wrecks from the Second World War? At the University of Hamburg, a professor of international maritime law has been addressing this sensitive issue for years. Henning Jessen is one of the few experts worldwide who are well versed in this complicated legal position. There is no international agreement applicable to war wreckage. It's a legal situation that's unsettled. You could say it's a grey area. The generally recognized view, according to Jessen, is that a warship belongs to what's called the flag state under whose flag the ship was fighting, even if it sank and became a wreck in the coastal waters of another state. Shouldn't then the owner also be responsible for damage from oil spills? If it sunk in armed conflict from being shelled or torpedoed, or if it's scuppered by its own crew in a hopeless situation, then according to applicable martial law, no liability ensues, because it's gone from being a ship to a wreck in the course of a military conflict. In other words, a flag state like Germany, to which the ships still belong, can legally extricate itself from the matter and pass the costs on to those suffering the damage? From the moral standpoint, normally a voluntary commitment or at least an accommodation with a coastal state suffering damage would be indicated. But from a juridical position, a flag state can indeed act precisely so. No state wants to create legal precedents. Benedict Hack has also come across this attitude when he's talked to German colleagues about the unsettled problem of the Stuttgart in the Bay of Gdansk. I say to them, hey, we've got some wrecks of yours. 
and they say, is there any gold? I say, no, there's none. And they say, ah, it's your problem. So, after 70 years, it's no longer a German problem, but ours. And the Stuttgart is only one of the problems. As Benedict Hack well knows, in the Bay of Gdansk alone, there are over 30 wrecks from the Second World War. He's particularly worried about the German supply ship Franken that was sunk by the Soviet Air Force shortly before the end of the war. A direct hit blew a huge hole in the ship, but the oil tanks remained intact. They could hold six times the amount of oil that has leaked from the Stuttgart. But it's likely that neither Poland nor Germany will feel responsible for pumping out the oil. Another wreck from the Second World War, one of over 6,300 worldwide, whose future is uncertain. It is a problem that's not visible until it really happens. So it's, it's if the vessel breaks up, if there's a spill, then we'll deal with it. These ships are doing nothing but deteriorating. They're sitting in salt water since the early 40s. It's going to become a chronic process. And you can either deal with it in place, or you can deal with cleaning up oil on the beaches on a more routine basis. The question is not whether, but when it will happen. The decision as to what we do about it is ours alone. <laughs>